So in my office, if you come to my office, you will not see a chess set, but you will see a backgammon set. And there is a difference between backgammon and chess. Chess, the best player always should win, right? Best player is going to make the right moves. In backgammon, the luckiest player will win because there is what? Dice. And those are the variables. You cannot control the dice. Amazing. Brian, Asher again. Or Asher. Which one do you prefer? I, let, let, let's go with Asher. Let's go with Asher. Because I call him Ashi. Yeah. So you, you know. You, you guys can call me whenever you Inside want. Inside track. Well, really excited to have you here, Brian. Brian is a multimillionaire from law. That's kind of fun. That's <laughs> kind of cool. Welcome. You can ask the folks that run the studio here. I, I've had all kinds of different people. So it's always fun to square up whatever you're saying with that in mind. Like this guy's really made it, you know, eight figures on... Um, more than one occasion, right? And uh, in your in your career, you also had Uber, uh, obviously that famous case. And I have some questions that you have not yet covered in, okay. in different podcasts because you've yeah. talked about the mad nauseum. Um, and then you also have, and I have to make sure make sure I don't fall into this trap where I just get so sucked into like just humans. And you have such an interesting story. Like your parents owned a clothing store. You were <laughs> a child actor. Mm -hmm. You um, you and Al Pacino had like a whole boating incident. Uh, aside from just being a stand-in, obviously we'll get into that. <laughs> Um, I don't so, remember the boating part, but yes, I was just standing in a movie. Yeah. I'll refresh your recollection, but um, let's so let's let's hear a little bit about your upbringing, like your parents owning a clothing store, and yeah, and, yeah. So I grew up in Miami Beach, and my parents had uh, this legendary men's clothing store in Surfside. I don't know if you know Miami Beach, but if if you bought a pair of uh, Sansa Belt pants or a members only jacket, members you, only, you, you bought it from my dad and mom's store. Yeah. Okay. And it's still there now, and, and now the, the store is the biggest kosher restaurant in Miami Beach, and my, my mom still owns the place. Oh, you're, you're a Jew? I'm a Jew. Nice. Yes. One of the tribe. Yes, yes. Okay. Nice That's Jewish cool. boy from Miami Beach. Okay. Well, not that nice, because you seem to be under the false impression that Miami is somehow better than Los Angeles. I've been hearing rumors about I, this. I, I don't know that uh, it's better, because I, I live here, and... Uh, I really love LA and Miami. I go back a lot, you know, I have an office there and, uh, but you know, Miami's my home. LA's where I live and this is where my roots are now. And I'm almost here as long as I was in Miami. I was in Miami 30 years. I've been here 25 years. Mm. We'll fill in a little bit of the gap though, your trajectory. So your parents own this very quaint, uh, members only, um, satellite, store and <laughs> and then you end up becoming this really successful trial or just fill in the gaps yeah so when i was a kid you know i grew up uh acting and and doing theater and stuff like that and then i became an athlete in high school which is rare for miami no to like push the acting in the mood in the I, 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 yeah i mean there was an industry there and and uh it wasn't until i went to law school where i became more uh, engaged in acting again when I realized, hey, you know, wow, I want to be a trial lawyer. And there's so much uh, overlap with, you know, performing and being a trial lawyer. So I got heavily involved in improv, met a great um, improv instructor. His name is Jerry Owens. He died a few months ago. And uh, was that the quote that you had up when I took your crash course? It was adults or atrophied children. So that is um, Keith Johnstone, who is uh, a guru of modern improv, who is someone I, I study. And that's the type of improv that we teach in this improv for trial program that we do, Johnstonian improv. But I learned from Jerry growing up and then uh, I became a lawyer in Miami for about five years before I moved out here and opened my practice. And like I said, I still have an office there now. So yeah, been acting my whole life and it's still a big part of what I do as a trial lawyer. And I love it. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she also does some improv and we're both alumni of uh, Groundlings. Yeah. So all of that is super important. Every lawyer, every human should take uh, an improv class. It's going to make you a better communicator. It's going to make you a better storyteller. And there's, you know, 
I did Groundlings already, I think over 11 year period of time working there. And it's a different style completely than the type of improv that I learned at Second City or at UCB or this program that I had created with some friends called Liquid Radio Players. And then of course, Impro, which is the Johnstonian style. There's so many different styles of improv. It's like dialects of, of a language, you know. Very cool. Yeah, it's just different. Uh, not, not one is better than the other, but knowing all the dialects of improvisation can allow you to really, you know, be fluent. In Give the us language. a specific story that your improv came to be super helpful in, in trial or just some rabbit out of the oh hat or uh, something unexpected. Well, I, I mean, I could go on every trial. I'm, I'm improvising every trial from the second I walk into the room. You know, the thing about improv is, and you know this, right? Yes. You learned at Groundlings, which is everything that's going on around you is part of the scene, whether you're planning it or not. And the most, the best stuff is the surprises that you're not expecting because you can't plan for it. And when you have a real reaction to information, it's genuine. And that's usually the, the best stuff. Asher, you know, has been coming to our trials and has tried a few himself. You know, you see those moments. Yeah. When, when you go up against someone who doesn't do improv and you are an improviser, the ability to use even seemingly bad things to help you, it's, it's so useful versus people who are, they're trying to read a script or they're trying to follow this cookie, cookie cutter method and the slightest, you know, bump in the road just messes them up Mm. versus, you know, we have witnesses that come out of nowhere and we're like, who is this person? And then we call them or we use them to our advantage. Yeah. You know, I think the key about uh, being an improviser is not being afraid to fail and, and learning how to fail. That's very important to do because if you've, if you haven't learned that skill when you do fail and you will, it's hard to rebound. But when you are practicing the art of failure, then you become an expert at it. Mm. And it looks like when something happens that you meant to do Mm -hmm. it and it looks seamless. And that's when you wow the audience, you know, and, and that's where I think the improv comes in the most. And then also just learning how to tell a story. Most people, really don't know how to tell a story or a good, compelling story. And understanding story structure, understanding I want to make sure you're talking into the mic. So uh, Understanding yeah. story structure, understanding narrative it is critical, uh, you know, because that, that's what we're doing. And, and we're not just telling a story alone. We're telling it with about 17 other people. We're telling it with 12 jurors, your co-counsel, the judge, opposing counsel, your witness, the clerk. It's it's a group story that's being told. And and understanding how to do that in effective ways, yeah. you don't just walk into the courtroom and do it naturally. Most people don't. We can get into the mechanics of story. I'm very fascinated by that topic, but I do want to try and milk you for more stories. Sure. And I want specific stories from you. You've been doing this for so long. I'll push you even for a story about failure. Maybe it's something that's, there's no statute of limitations on it because it happened early in your career. So it doesn't really matter anymore. But some, some point where you realize, Hey, I'm failing and you pivoted or something like that. Well, I mean, I had a client in this Uber trial, for instance, who I'd love to hear the failure in your $6.8 million victory story. This is it almost like I, there was a moment in the trial where I thought to myself, well, this is it. It's over. Do you remember that moment, yeah. Asher? We, you were in the room. Yeah. So my client had suffered a lot and, and had a tremendous uh, emotional impact from, from the crash. And, you know, people didn't know this. It really didn't come out during discovery, but, you know, he almost took his own life. Um, and it wasn't discussed, but I knew that it had happened. And I asked him without rehearsing and without preparing him for this question, what was the darkest moment of your experience? And he 
started to have a panic attack during the trial. So much so that he was starting to hyperventilate. He was breaking down. and On the stand. It, on the stand. And it seemed to me like 10 minutes. I don't even know how long it was. But I remember thinking to myself, it could cause a mistrial. That's how yeah, far it was going. I, I really thought that that's what was going to happen. And and by the way, the jury, because I was watching the jury, they were like completely shocked because they did not because before that panic attack happened, it was it was a direct examination, question answer, question answer. But when that happened, they were like, "Oh my God, what's?" So Asher's watching them and I'm watching my client and I'm of course trying to watch them, but I'm thinking, how do I rescue this situation? And I didn't want to, you know, like ask for a timeout. Uh, but, and and the judge, thankfully, he was a very good judge. Judge Levanas saw that moment and the judge called a timeout and we went back into the jury room and I, my client was inconsolable at that moment. And I didn't know if he could continue. Thankfully, he was able to. He was able to gather his thoughts. But then we had to go back into the courtroom and get back into that moment again, which had been, you know, very jarring. It's hard to get back into that moment again. And and we did. Uh, And I used some improv techniques that I teach on how to do that. And... It worked actually very beautifully and, and it didn't seem because it wasn't rehearsed. It was completely unknown situation and it was so visceral that you, you could literally hear a pin drop and the jury, I could feel and see their concern. Is he going to be okay? Mm -hmm. And, and at that moment, you know, that's, that's where trials are. That's where the the pendulum shifts. That's where it goes from two million to five million to six point eight million to bigger. You know, in those real moments, because you're not you're not you know manufacturing that. That's reality. That's being in the mm-hmm. moment. That's understanding. You know, reading the room and taking the temperature and really listening. Those are that's improv, right? I've never seen a, a diamond on a gold ring with a that, that's really unique. So this was my father's. This goes back to the story of my dad's store. You want to hear it? Yeah. So, so you're, you're wearing, just to set it up, you're wearing a ring that looks like real gold with like a nice rock. It is. It is. Yeah. So my dad had this store, you know, this is probably in the 1970s when this happened. And, um, you know, a lot of gangsters used to shop at my dad's store. Um, and uh, Meyer Lansky, I don't know if you know him, like, Big, you know, short little Jewish guy who lived around the Fixed corner. the World Series. He used to come to the store. and But this one guy comes to the store and he's like, hey, uh, Harry, uh, listen, I got this this diamond here. I got I to gotta get it off my hands. Maybe we can, you know, work out a barter or something. And my, members uh, only, and my mom's like, sure, we'll do something. And so, you know, they <laughs> give him all this clothes. And my my dad takes the diamond as payment. And a week later, in the front of the Miami Herald, it's this gangster gets shot and is killed. Wow. It was the guy who gave him the diamond. A waste of clothing. Well, you know, but uh, so that's that's the the story. That's That's the story of where this diamond. And then your dad gave it to you. And then when my dad passed away, my mom, um, you know, put it on my finger and hasn't left since. That's really beautiful, actually. Yeah. Is your mom still around? Yeah, she is. And, uh, you know, it's interesting I use, um, I don't use the ring, but I use a, a, another object that my dad gave me during jury selection. And I, I shared this with Asher. It's a very powerful tool, if you're interested. Yeah, what do, what do you do? Well, all right. So, you know, how do you, how do you put a price on health and pain and suffering? And so I usually ask jurors, I say, you know, does anybody here have an item, a precious item to them that was given to them or that they have like a lucky pair of underwear or a piece of jewelry or something. And everybody raises their hand. I have this blanket my grandma gave me or I have this ring my 
mother gave to me was her engagement ring, those kinds of things. And I show them a coin. That was another thing that my dad had given to me. He was in World War II. And I say, oh, I, I have something I carry in my pocket during the trial. And I, and I showed it to him. And I say, is that item priceless to you? And they, they say, yeah, it is. And I go, would you sell it? And they all go, no. I go, I'll give you a million dollars for it. They're like, no, wouldn't do it. I say, okay. You're doing this in voir dire when you're in selecting a jury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know what? I feel the same way about this. It's so precious to me. It means so much. And I said, but let me ask you a question. What if I guaranteed you perfect health for the rest of your life in exchange for that item? Nine times out of 10, everybody says, here, take it. And then there's always that one weirdo that goes, no, I, I wouldn't do that. And I'm like, okay, fine. You have a price for your health. Either way, you're winning with that Either way illustration. You win. That's and a so, nice little and, and so, you know, it's important to be, pay attention to what people are doing or saying or like that ring that you noticed it. So that's what a good improviser does. Notices small details and then uses those details to connect with people. Yeah, everything in the room. We could be here for three days. I'm, I'm just starting on the ring. You yeah, got, exactly. You, got beads you haven't even gotten clean. to my, my lucky underwear yet. <laughs> well, sp speaking of, of using everything in the room, I, I really like that story about using the caution sign that was there the entire trial in your closing. Yeah. Have you told the story yet? I, I, I don't know that I've told this uh, many times. but uh, It's a so perfect example of using the room to your advantage. So I tried a case with Asher's dad, who you met, Steve, brilliant lawyer. And we had a case where it was on video where a woman is walking into a building and she slips and falls and goes down really hard and breaks her elbow. While she's walking, she walks past a slippery when wet sign. She walks right by it. And then about 15 feet later, she falls where the water was. You'd expect the sign to be right where the water is, right? but it wasn't, and that's part of the case. <clears throat> During the closing, I had seen something on the first day of trial and I never said anything about it. During the closing, I said to ladies and gentlemen, you know, the answer to this trial and why we're here has been in this courtroom the entire time. Stand up. And the jury stood up. This is in closing. You get them to stand up. Nice that the judge let you do that. He had no idea what I was doing. And <laughs> I, neither did I in that moment. And I didn't know if anyone would stand. But I think like nine out of 12 of them stood up. So Simon says, I already got them to stand up. I go, all right, I got them. I go, look, right here, right next to my foot. What do you see? And there was a little box, like a, a junction box where you put plugs in, right? And there was yellow and black caution tape. And it said, caution, watch your step. I go, that's where you put the warning, where the danger is. Because I've been watching you all walk by this thing for the last two weeks and you've all been avoiding it. You can sit down now. And they all go, that's great. I go, you don't put the warning and I walked away 15 feet and I counted it out loud. You don't put the warning over here. You put it over there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a liability case where they were arguing she should have known, she should have seen, it was open obvious. And so just being aware of something that's in the room. Yeah, and then using it. And using you it. Also, you also do puppet shows? What the heck is that? So, <laughs> What are you talking about? Asher was there for that too. You know, first of all, you can't do this in every trial. You know, uh, it, it has- brings a little Kermit with him. Well, it was, it was this, close. This, it, yeah, was a, it was a can't. Oscar the Grouch. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. it was not that far. Try, try it at your own risk. Yeah, so I, you know, during the trial, this the defense attorney was this kind of old grouch guy. And next to him was I am this shocked with how you're starting the story. And, and and next to him was this younger, like sharp suit, you know, the corporate lawyer who's representing the corporation. And I'm thinking to myself, 
you know, because that guy kept writing shit down and was handing it to the other guy and the other, and he would say it. I'm like, what a puppet. I'm like, grouch, puppet. And that, I, I went like tearing through my kids' toys and I found the Oscar the Grouch. And so the next day we're in court and it's the last day of testimony. And the judge goes, Judge Fracious, who was fantastic. She goes, you know, uh, we're going to be doing closing arguments tomorrow. And I don't want you to object during closing because, you know, closing is the lawyer's turn to just, you know, argue the evidence. And as long as you're talking about the evidence, there should be no objections. I go, that's fine with me. She goes, because you can do anything during closing. I go, I can do anything. She goes, yes, you can do anything. I said, can I do a puppet show? She goes, of course you can do of a puppet course. show. Would you? She goes, are you going to do marionettes or a hand puppet? And I go, you know, I haven't thought of that yet. Meanwhile, I just <laughs> set up for the next day. I show up with a box, a, a banker's box. And I go and I put it on my desk. And a she, what box? A banker's box. You know, like a, a, a evidence box. You know, one of these things you put gotta, files gotta, gotta, like. Gotta. And I put it and I put it on my desk. And she goes, okay, Mr. Brighter. And I get up and I go, ladies and gentlemen, this is my chance now to do my closing argument where I get to speak, just me, without any interruptions, alone. You won't be hearing from defense. In fact, I don't even think he's going to object. But I get to talk to you alone. Oh, yeah. What's that? And I reach into the box and I pull out Oscar the Grouch. And I go, who are you? I'm the defense argument. What? Yeah. Well, this is not your turn. What, are you afraid? No, I'm not afraid. Oh, it looks like it. Well, this is very unorthodox. Too bad. And I go, fine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a case about an ambulance that uh, ran a red light and crashed into my client. <clears throat> this is about a case where a vehicle slowly proceeded through the intersection and made contact with the vehicle. This is word for word, by the way. And I go, uh, well, come on. They, they've already seen the video of the crash. What video? The video. You saw the video? Yes, they saw the video. Don't show them the video. I go, they've already seen it. Uh, all right. So my client went to the hospital, not until the next day. All right, look, I, I just can't do this anymore. Oh, no, what, you can't shut me up. And I told her, put him in the box. And I go, that was ridiculous. <laughs> but that's what's going on here. This is that's the defense word. argument. And, you know, then later in my rebuttal, that's when I called him a puppet. I said, you know, this defense attorney, I feel bad for him. He's coming up here. He's trying to, it's hard for him because he really doesn't have any good arguments here. But the other guy, the suit, he's writing down all the questions. And this guy's just a puppet for the corporation. And that's why we're here. And you saw that defense attorney. What? He was so shook. That's I, I have, TV. There was no yeah. recovering. That is I, wilder than on TV. I've never seen somebody just in, in the, I mean, the, he could not recover. He folded. He completely folded. It uh, was and, unbelievable. And then after, he's like, oh, I was going to take my sock and use it as a puppet. I'm like, well, you didn't. I was going to take the puppet from you and use it. I was like, but you didn't. He froze. Because that's just so crazy. Well, no. I mean, people are afraid to fail in that moment. What if it doesn't work? What if they laugh? What if somebody objects? And so you have to, the, you know. The, the cojones, the Goodyear blimp balloon level cojones to do something like that is just, it can't be overstated. That's crazy. Well, wow. I mean, look, Nick Rowley put on a chicken suit, right? I did this game show uh, closing when I did that Terminex case. I, I've done... What was the game show closing? Well, now I'm telling you my greatest hits. So? 
He wouldn't tell us a failure story. I'll tell you that right now. So at least no, I, I had some plenty. I, you, you said a failure story where failure I recovered. Failure story. You said all the client almost broke. That was a good story. <laughs> well, that's like, a, oh, and then we win. But that's a failure. <laughs> you didn't even I fail mean, in that story. Well, look, I, you know, I'm not afraid of failure. I, I don't call them failures. I call them opportunities to fix. You know, that's beautiful. you know, really, that's what it is. Because if you're if you're afraid, then it's failure. You also did the time machine in the Uber case. Pretty brilliant stuff. Yeah. Bob Simon does a lot of that, but you did it in like an even higher level way. The the time machine. Illustrate that for us, please. Well, I can read it to you. I, I suppose I I. But also do the game show. Don't close the game show. <laughs> well, let me tell you the game show. So I, I did this case uh, with Steve's dad. Uh, sorry, with uh, Ashi's dad, Steve, uh, where we tried a case against Terminex. And Terminix put on these crazy experts. They were all lying. They covered up everything. And it was. So it was that they fumigated a thing next door. It leaked in and super injured this one guy. Right. It poisoned him. He lost his smell and taste. Right. And he's a young guy. And so, you know, I did the beginning of my uh, closing where I played a clip from Ratatouille. And then. What? I did some what? drawings. I did some illustrations. <laughs> I did what some are you talking about? I did some illustrations about because I have an artist that illustrates the trial. Then I talked about some of the evidence and then I said to the judge, I go, uh, Your Honor, I'm sorry, I forgot something in the jury room. It was in the middle of my closing. And he goes, uh, okay. And I go into the jury room and I close the door. And inside the jury room I had a microphone. And in the jury room, you don't see me, but you hear this over the loudspeaker. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for America's favorite game show. Tell the truth. And I bust open the door with the microphone and I come out as a cheesy game show host. Yes, tell the truth where you, the studio audience, get to determine if the defense experts were lying or telling the truth. Let's meet our contestant, Atlas Ferreira, and tell him what he's going to win or lose. You're going to lose your sense of smell for Forever. Okay, tonight's show is brought to you by Terminex, the company that sprays poison in your face. Let's get back to our show. And so behind me, I had the... the uh, you I know, love how your dad point. neglects to mention this. He's like, <laughs> yeah, whatever, we want a bunch of money. <laughs> I, had the, uh, I had the PowerPoint of the experts and like their heads would pop up and there was like a BS meter saying about how whether they were lying or telling the truth. And I went through each of it and it was like 20 minutes. In the middle of the game show, I do a commercial. And now it's time for a commercial break. Brought to you by Terminex. And I did ter a Terminex commercial. Dead serious. Where, you know, I have the Terminex guy with the hat and he's there with Terminex. And I'm like, hey, we're Terminex. We do everything right. We do everything safe because we care about, you know, whether we're uh, gassing a school or a church or a you know, business, we let everyone know we're going to be pumping poison into the walls because we don't want to get you hurt. You know, that kind of stuff. And then I cut back to the show. Now it's time for the lightning round where Terminex can roll the dice with safety. You know, and if they get anything but craps, they win. And so, uh, you know, we just continued this through this wild. game show. Uh, what, did you run this past Steve? You were like, hey, I'm going to try this like totally crazy thing. Here. Yes. So what we did was because I had to I had work. to clear this with the client because, you know, and the client was <laughs> a hysterical guy with a great sense of humor. And I said, look, I'm just going to do this. Just watch me do it one time. And you tell me what they think. And they loved it. The focus group. It wasn't a really a focus group. It was Steve. Chance and Atlas, my client, and they sat there. I remember it was a Sunday. We came in. This is right like during the pandemic. The pandemic had just been announced. The verdict and then the doors to the courthouse closed two days later. Yes. And so, you know, I practiced it for them and they're like, we love it. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So risky. And, um, you know, the courtroom was filled with people. And I, I told them at the beginning, I said, I'm going to do something. I wouldn't tell anybody what I'm doing. I said, whatever you do, don't laugh. Because I wanted the jury to be the barometer of it. And they were like holding their mouths. And I could see that the judge was, you know, entertaining. He was a great judge. Took my verdict away. Gave a, a grant a new right, trial. You won it on appeal. Yeah, yeah. we won it on appeal. So he did me a favor. Um, but um, 
anyway, that's that's the story of that one. So, I saw I saw that that sh- that closing, and I was still in law school at the time. I was like, that's what I want to do one day. Yeah, yeah, for real. Because when you see somebody do a game show in front of a jury, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, I've never seen anything like that again, and before that, so. Well, Amazing. you know, we're always trying to come up with different ways to tell a story, you know, and, and every, I, I wouldn't probably wouldn't do that same thing with a different jury if they weren't ready for it. You know, that jury was set up for that from day one of jury selection. Like I knew my, just from my interactions, what I could get away with on that, on that panel. And that's part of, you know, knowing your audience. Exciting. You know, you're making me passionate again about being a lawyer. Like, wow, I've, I've tried a couple cases. I would never even, and I'm like pretty out of the box. I wouldn't think to even go anywhere near as far as where you're going. So this is really helpful. I'm going to, I'm going to be pushing the envelope now, my next trial. Well, that's going to do it all in one, a chicken soup game show, you know, puppet show guy. Exactly. (laughs) Look, this is what we do. And Asher has been a big part of this. We do these improvised trials at my office. Your office is beautiful, by the way. Thank Both you. of all the floors with the, the courtroom. Yeah, Asher was yeah, showing I gave me him a tour last week. Yeah. I was in your office. You weren't there. Yeah. I was there. <laughs> nice that, fish tank. That's why all, all my stuff was moved around. <laughs> I, even if I, it would take me a day to get all your stuff out of the office. <laughs> exactly. so, no, I did not do that. I have too much crap in there. But no, it's memorabilia. It's cool stuff. But the but the courtroom also, I was like, there was, that was really cool. I wanted to hear about that, how you built like your your firm that's something that must have taken a, a lot of dedication and vision to get that off the ground you have like a really dedicated team like I, I talked with your managing partner he's just so chill and so cool like each person has their role yeah you know everybody brings their personality their thing to the how'd to you the make table. your first million i make my first million yes sir i got my first million dollar verdict when i was a trial lawyer for three weeks <laughs> I got sent to Key West, Florida to go try a case against one final defendant in a case that had settled out with everyone where a guy had, somebody had taken a safety um, off of a miter box saw so that you know you could cut faster because the safety had been taken off. And because of that, he had sawed off his, his finger. And so, one finger, million bucks from one unsettled well, defendant. Well, You're we're, a beast. We're, we're, we're giving away the punchline. But so they go, listen, you know, go try this case. It's one defendant left. We've settled with everyone. We don't care what happens. You know, there was like a small amount of money available left that we could get. They flew me in a, in a boat plane. What? It- uh, it's called a chalk. It was Chalks Airline, where it was a plane that lands on the water, and it lands on the water in Key West. And I'm like this young kid, and I walk in. I'm like, I don't even know where the frick the courthouse is. I get there, and um, I'd never tried a civil case before, and I knew how to do it because I'd done all the trial competitions. So I'm like, okay, I know how to do a witness and opening and closing. And then I realized they'd never taught us how to pick a jury. And so now I start having a, a panic attack. And so there's some lawyers like walking around. I'm like, hey, uh, listen, <laughs> I have to pick a jury. Like, how do you do that? They're like, you're kidding, right? I go, no, I'm starting a trial. And they go, just just talk to them. Just like, just talk to them Cocktail like they're hour. your friends. Yeah. And at that time I had been doing, um, you know, a lot of improv. And I said, all right, I'm going to treat this like an improv game where I just, whatever gift whatever information the jury gives me, I'm going to celebrate it. Even if it's bad information, there's a game, an improv game where you receive gifts and you have to be happy to get them. Even if it's like a shit sandwich. And so I played this game with them and I learned all the jurors names and I, but the, you wouldn't believe the people on my jury that I had with a, I had a juggler. I had a carpenter. I had a painter. I had a, a, Somebody who played the fiddle, you know, this is Key West where you have like pirates and stuff. And a so, ten finger <laughs> monocle mattress, exactly. model, model uh, like a ring model. <laughs> and so I had all these great jurors, and I got a million dollar verdict. And after when I came back, they're like, "Okay, you're trying all the cases." And so then I, I started getting a lot of trial experience. Damn. Um, and so, and that's what we're trying to do with Asher. So like, he's he's already tried a couple cases. 
And we don't care if he wins or loses them. It's just going in and trying the case. Yeah. yeah. Right? What did we tell you when we gave you the, the first couple cases? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really at this point, especially, it's not about win or lose, although I try to win. You don't want, nobody likes losing, but if I'm doing the best job I can for the client and I'm learning along the way, that's a win for me. So I think that totally. changing, changing the definition of what winning is. Yeah, I mean, um, winning a lot of times is just showing up Yeah, and conquering the fear. You know, most lawyers out of 100 maybe one tries a case, right? Yeah. Well, half are transactional, so there you go. And then another half of that half, they don't really touch a courtroom much. And, for and then it's reason. hard to get a case to trial. And if you're going to trial, there's something wrong with your case. Usually. Otherwise, it would have settled, mm -hmm. right? Why did Uber take you to trial? Because I wouldn't let that one settle. You just couldn't let it go. You, you, I would not let that one. They offered you a million and a half. You're like, now nah, we're going further. I want that. Well, I had 6. to 8. explain to my client why it made sense. And he understood and he allowed me to do it. I mean, I didn't what, do people have him. People have policies through Uber? No. So how did you get? Well, to now Uber? because I got a verdict against Uber, I can tell you all the stuff because it's not confidential. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a nice thing? Yeah. So Uber had $250 million of insurance. I'm not bound by a confidentiality agreement. Sorry, Uber. That's why I tried the case. And so there was a, a, a million dollars. Well, even for the when you sign a confidentiality agreement, you it's the attorney. I didn't sign to it a con right. You won a verdict. I, I won a we, verdict. We there was I'm no confidentiality. They wanted one after I got the verdict. Uh, I'm sure they, they would have liked me to uh, do one, but I refused. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So you were saying 250 million, quarter of a billion in, in coverage available. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so we're, we're 30 minutes out. Okay, so quarter of a billion in coverage. Yeah. And so I knew there was plenty of coverage there. And even if there was no coverage, it doesn't matter. Uber has money. But how money. do you tap into the buckets of, of Uber money? Let's say a guy, he's an Uber driver. He has his own state farm insurance. He's not no, insured, he's insured no, no, no. through Uber? No, no. So Uber has a driver policy. In this case, Uber had a driver policy of a million dollars. Okay. Because I'm not talking about other cases. I'm talking about this case. And there was a $1 million policy there. Um, and then there's Uber has insurance. Now the point is, was he operating within the course and scope of his, of his relationship with Uber so that they would be vicariously liable? Now, of course they fought us on that and we fought back and there was going to be a judge to decide that issue regarding respondeat superior. And before that was ruled on, they stipulated for this case only. So we entered into a stipulation that basically said on the day of the crash, this driver was logged into the Uber app and Uber is vicariously liable for his negligence, which was admitted on the day of trial for this case only. Those are the magic words. And so perfect storm opportunity and the jury liked our client believed it i mean it was a real case it was a real yeah, no, case he was and so injured. um and so now i think it's like a watershed moment that now we know what the juries feel about uber and they're uh, such a shady company oh my lordy lord well again none of that comes in no it's just jury has perception of it. You know, there were a couple jurors that are like, I love Uber and I drive for Uber, but many of them, because we're in Santa Monica, we're not Uber drivers. Because you're in Santa Monica, you get Uber riders. You try this case downtown, you get Uber drivers. So it's a different jury pool. I approach the voir dire very differently. And I'm happy to share my voir dire with you. You should read it. It's, a, it's an interesting one. I would love to read it. Please yeah. do send I'll follow up with both of you for the yeah, transcript of that. Sure. That's definitely... And, and so, I mean, it was just, there were so many happy accidents, like improvisational moments that happened in that trial. We did the trial like almost backwards. They called like seven of the defense witnesses in our case. And I allowed it because I knew it was throwing off the way they wanted to tell their story. Right? Pretty cool pretty chessy of you. It, well, I mean, I just was, okay, I'm going to move these story elements around. And when you learn improv, you learn about how to move, you know, uh, story elements and be nimble with them. You know, you look at some, there are movies that are told backwards. Mm -hmm. 
There are movies where there are flashbacks and flash forwards. Then there are linear stories. But just understanding that um, you can change the narrative if you're not stuck to your script that you wrote out. Yeah. It gives you a, a tremendous amount of power as a, as a storyteller. Yes, totally. I agree. I gave you a gift, though, of something you shouldn't have been stuck to the script of you were boating incident with Al Pacino, and you threw right back in my face. You're like, there's no boating incident, you bastard. There was no boating incident. I'm sorry. I wish there was. <laughs> I was just standing in a movie, and uh, I mean, there was, a mo- there was an embarrassing <laughs> moment. Oh, really? Yeah, sure. So um, I was his stand-in. So as a stand-in, they shoot the scenes without the star having to be there. And so I was his stand-in because I was the same size and they cut my hair like him. And I kind of actually looked like him at the time. And um, there was a scene. Do your best Al Pacino impression. Well, great ass. That was really good, actually. Thanks. So uh, there's this place called Vizcaya, which is this Italian villa in Miami Beach, in Miami. And there was this scene in the movie where there's this black tie affair. And Al Pacino's coming down these stairs and he's like looking for, you know, this woman he's going to talk to. But I got to do the scene first. And first of all, it's Oliver Stone is the director. And all the huge, like every movie star is in this movie. Cameron Diaz and... uh, uh, Matthew Modine and just um, Lawrence Taylor and Bill Bellamy and Jamie Fox, all just amazing. Keep going, stars, it, stars, stars galore. And um, I get to do the scene, so I'm like, okay, I'm walking down the stairs. I'm in a tuxedo, and everybody's looking. I mean, they're shooting the scene, and I'm like, wow, this is fucking cool. So then I go, and now they're like, okay, call in Al. He's going to do it now because they lit it. They blocked the shot. They blocked the shot and everything. So Oliver Stone is there, and he's got the camera, and I'm like right behind him. <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is it, man. This is like, this is cool. And Al Pacino's walking down. You, you know, when you're an actor, you want to be in the moment, you know. And so one thing you should never do is like stare at another actor when they're trying to be in a moment. So what do I do? He's walking down. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and he's walking down and his eyes lock no with mine. God. And he goes, tell that kid to stop staring at me. <laughs> and everyone turns and looks at me and I'm like, <laughs> they're like, Brian, can you please leave? And I was like, <laughs> that was, mm-hmm. And then he threw you off his boat. In the after me, party. No, there was no boat. Uh, <laughs> but there was. Uh, but no, he was very nice. He was very nice. Right on. That's yeah, cool. He was cool. So you had a bit of a stint then. You were like uh, touching royalty with your acting stuff. And... Yeah, there was a you know here and there. Mm-hmm. But uh, I made you know I don't I don't make my money as an actor. Mm. Oh, you still do it? Yeah. What capacity? I you Ash, teach Ash, improv Asher, for trial. I teach I improv, that. but Asher saw a movie I was in last last yeah. year, Night of the Hunted. Yeah. Really, really good movie. And I shot a Walmart commercial last year. Are you then, serious? Yeah. That's serious. That's yeah, cool. I still got my SAG card. I still do it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That's that's very interesting. And in fact, you know, I've been itching to do like a scene study class and just do some, you know, old school connect with another actor. Do you, you don't a have a passion project that you want to take all your winnings with and try and like fund it a little I bit? I will never fund a movie. Don't ever put your own money into a movie. Right. It's the first thing I learned. <laughs> Let somebody else fund it. I'll act in it. But um, no, I'm actually making a film right now. It's funny that you say that. I have this super tragic wrongful death case where a husband and wife, and she's pregnant, were killed. Oh, God. And um, I hired a filmmaker that I know to take all the photos and the video and the voiceover of the family members and create like a trailer of this story for the mediation that's coming up and for the criminal proceedings that are coming for the manslaughter um, case that's taking place right now too. And so, you know... Humanize them. But just show them what's coming. Like if you don't resolve this case, this is the story that the jury's going to get to hear. Um. And that, that can be very powerful. We do these day in the life videos. We had this gentleman who was paralyzed um, 
And literally from the moment he woke up until the moment he would go to bed and the nurse that would come and pull the poops out and him putting his catheter in and just seeing him take his withered legs and put them in his chair, you know, that is some heavy shit to see. And then have him go to a doctor's appointment and just show that's what his life is now. That's, that's hardcore. Mm -hmm. And the other side doesn't get to see it. They may read about it in a deposition, but to see it shows them what's... Changes you know, the game. Yeah, it does. Talk about your initial, when you start your own firm, like me and Asher are going through this in some capacity, both of us different ways of you balance. I have to write a motion today. I also mm -hmm. want to do a podcast. I have to you know, market myself. Like that fine line, you're wearing so many different hats. How did you organize yourself in a way to set yourself up for success? When you have a lot of hats... You need more heads. So when the time is right, because I told Ashray what I tell you to do. Hire someone. It's time, you know, when you get to that point. <clears throat> I've actually never heard that phrase, and it sounds like such a befitting phrase. When you have a lot of hats, hire more heads, yeah. Makes just, a lot of sense. just made that up. Oh, really? That's a really good thing, yeah. <laughs> That's improv. <laughs> That's great. That yeah. is beautiful. <laughs> so, no, seriously, you can't yeah. do it alone. And you got you to gotta create a team when the time is right. Because, of course, you want to keep your costs low if you can. It's important to find a mentor. Talk about a month or two or at some point, maybe that you didn't have this and that's totally valid. I'm not trying to pry for nothing, but when you're like running out of, uh, what, talking the mic, I'll bring the mic down a little. When, um, you, there, maybe there's like uh, a month or two or something that there's, how am I gonna make payroll? But like the sh show has to continue. So it's like when you felt jammed, did you get like a settlement come out of nowhere or something like talk about those times, the struggle bus or you won a million dollars off a boat plane. This guy never had a struggle in his life. Well, we didn't get paid all of that in that case because there wasn't coverage to, to get it. I got the the verdict. That doesn't mean we got paid. And Al Pacino took most of it anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, he had to pay for the boat he damaged. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, no, uh, look, you know, you're going to have lean times and that's the struggle of being that's why sometimes you need help and that's when you have a relationship with another firm if you can't fund the case you it's time to bring in someone that can do that for you or you know don't be afraid to ask a family member for help it's like look i need <clears throat> i need an investment mm -hmm. You know, everybody's in a different situation. There's companies out there that'll loan you the money. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard managing a caseload because the, <clears throat> the system is designed to put the pressure on the lawyer and the client to settle. And you want to take that carrot and it's hard not to hold out because there's money there. And, you know, in our case, thankfully for us, we don't have to take a million dollars. We don't have to take a $10 million offer. We don't have to take a $20 million offer. Mm -hmm. But that's a very unique problem to have. Um, Not a problem. But people often also wonder, what do judges do? when, If you have a jury deciding, well, then what's the judge's role? Describe that part to people that might not be so informed with a story of a judge in chambers saying, okay, we're not doing the knock that off or, you know, calling the balls and strikes. So people well, can that, kind of get a sense. Well, of that's what the judge is. The, you know, the judge is the referee and it's the judge's house. So you got to play by the judge's rules. And sometimes judges don't always follow the rules or they interpret the rules differently. And judges don't give you anything, by the way, as a plaintiff's lawyer, you never get really anything from a judge. They're just there to take things away from you. Mm, powerful. Well, it is. And so you need to be able to adjust to things being taken away. And that's something that we teach in improv. The first game we teach yes, is... Yes, you did a great game. Don't use an S. Right. You can talk, have a conversation, don't use S in your, in your conversation. Exactly. So you have to be able to do something without the thing you rely on the most. How can I... When you, you figure out how to get around these because a obstacles. judge might say oh you guys can't talk about this prior thing that Correct. happened and it's like oh i need to talk about that thing right. no you can't talk about it well, there's other ways to get information in or or there's creative ways to deliver the same message so 
judges are there to make sure that both sides are playing fair. Some judges are amazing. Some judges are very neutral and will let you try your case. Others will not. Others are advocates, and I've seen it. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. It shouldn't be that way. The majority of them that I've encountered are great. And there's a few that, you know, you I, I'd rather not. <laughs> you seem so, I use the adjective chessy before, which is not a word, like as if you're playing chess. So, but So that, that's funny that you say that. So in my office, if you come to my office, you will not see a chess set, but you will see a backgammon set. And there is a difference between backgammon and chess. Chess, the best player always should win, right? The best player is going to make the right moves. In backgammon, the luckiest player will win. Because there is what? Dice. And those are the variables. You cannot control the dice. Now, most of the time when you have equal players, you know, it's the dice ultimately that decide the game. If the players make the right moves, the dice, the variables. So the worst player can beat the best player in backgammon based on luck. And it's the same. And, and I heard a story, I don't know, if the, the origin of chess versus backgammon, like, I think, um, you know, India uh, had created the, the game of chess and, and brought it to the Persian king and said, look at this game. My generals made this game chess and we use it and that's how we train our generals and it helps us in battle. And he told his game maker, I want a game like that. And he came back and he said, I created backgammon for you. It's more realistic. He goes, well, how? Because in battle... Things happen that you cannot plan for. Bad weather, famine, supply lines are jammed. People don't show up, just like a trial. And you have to be able to improvise during these situations that you cannot plan for everything. And in chess, you're planning every move. You're planning five moves, six, seven moves ahead. Mm -hmm. Me 12 moves ahead, but right. yes, I hear what you're saying. So I'm not a chess guy. I One thing that you can plan for is is your wardrobe. I'm curious, do you have, that's what I was getting at, you're so calculated. Like, do you have, oh, I'm going to use softer for my, when I'm interrogating my client, or more harsh charcoal for when I'm, so we like had this in the, and ties. We had this in the Uber trial, and we had this in the Terminix case. Every day in the Terminix case, I wore a different pair of socks that were food. I wore cherry socks, I wore banana socks, I wore apple socks. And so every day, I would, and one day it was hamburgers. And so every day the jury would see these food socks because this guy lost his ability to smell and taste. I love that. And I also had pieces of fruit every day on my desk. I'd have the most beautiful piece Lunch. of fruit. Every day was a, one day was an apple, You're one just, day was a pear, <laughs> one day was a banana. And Didn't uh, you also have like reeds or like smelling? I had a, a bag of jasmine that I yeah. brought in during the closing. <laughs> but um, in this Uber trial, it's offering like the tobacco, like the smelling thing. Like, it, it's funny you say yeah. that in the in the Uber trial, I had you know the the um, painting by Edvard Munch, the Scream. Of course, I had the Scream socks on on the day I was doing my client's testimony. And I made sure to sit with my legs crossed so that the jury could see the screen. And that was the day he had the breakdown. And then in my closing, I talked about art and how priceless art can be. And I put up the picture of the screen. After the verdict, this juror goes, oh, I knew exactly what you were doing. I go, what was I doing? He goes, you are subliminally giving us messages. I go, like what? He goes, you wore the scream socks. I go, yeah. On the day your client was testifying. Yeah. And it was emotional. Right. And then in your closing, you put the scream picture. I'm like, right. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, of course it did. Because I knew you were watching it. I did it for you, sir, you know, to make those connections. 
Everything we do in the courtroom is being watched. That's bloody brilliant, man. I'm glad I asked about clothing. We got a good sock story. That was amazing. Better than I could have hoped for. Seriously, that's yeah. wild. I mean, the ties I choose, the, you know, every little thing we do in the courtroom is being watched. It's part of the story. If, if Let me ask you a question. If you're watching a play, like a scripted play, right, where there's actors that are doing a, a show, and they do the same show over and over and over, right? You've seen a play before. Yes, sir. And if there's a, a hat rack with a hat on it, and for some reason somebody bumps into it and like the hat falls on the floor, and you're an actor in that play, what are you gonna do? Right, if you don't address it, then it's just weird, it's tilted. And what is the audience gonna be doing? They're just gonna be like, yo, that just happened. <laughs> and they're gonna be like, what the fuck is that hat? Is that part of the show? Why, I'm not listening to anything now until they, with this hat. And if you don't like address that, you, the audience is like, well, why is it there? Yeah. So even the smallest, like I would incorporate that into the scene. If I was an actor, I'd be like, oh, my hat, you know, oh, this is my father's hat. And I'd put it back, you know, where mm -hmm. it belongs and go back into the scene. Mm -hmm. That's the, everything is important in the courtroom. Even if you drop a piece of paper, and but I'm going to tell the best the best story. It's my favorite story. That in ten years, when you're interviewing Asher, he's going to tell you how important this was. Do you remember this? Okay. So Asher's in a trial, and um, he's trying it with this guy named Peter Diamond, who's a very experienced trial he's lawyer. Amazing. And he goes up there, and it's a dog bite case, and he goes, "Ladies and gentlemen, it's a very serious case." And at the end, after you've heard all this evidence, we are going to seek a verdict of thousands of dollars. Tell them what you did. So, and this all happened in like a split second, but I'm thinking to myself, did he just say thousands of dollars? <laughs> because it's supposed to be hundreds of thousands. <laughs> and the jury... We'll just give us thousands of dollars right now. If that's what we're asking for. So I, I don't want to interrupt him, but you have to. It's like the hat on the ground. So I write as in my crappy handwriting, hundreds of thousands, and I run up to Peter, <laughs> and Peter goes, hundreds of thousands, and the jury is like they're dying of laughter, uh, and it, <laughs> and that was like such a funny and important mo moment to do. It's like. Uh, <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> and, and it humanized Peter and, and it, it made him more relatable. But that was that falling of the hat moment. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is like one of my like first trials and I'm freaking out inside because I don't know if I'm supposed to interrupt the main trial lawyer, but I'm happy I did. Yeah. Because I heard Brian's voice in my head, write hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> right now and run up to Peter or else I'm going to kill you. So, yeah. So I was ballsy to do that. Well, he had to. Uh, you could you imagine if he didn't? Right. Yeah, because you can't exactly fix your opening. It's not like you have a rebuttal to your opening. exactly. <laughs> oh, by the way, when I you know last week when I <laughs> told you thousands, I I meant hundreds yeah. of thousands. That's very funny. You know, just being in the moment and 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 just just seeing every little. Yeah, I thing. love that stuff. I soak everything in. Everything the jury tells me, I try to make subtle references because in what you get to talk to them. It's yeah. so interesting that that's the process. And like, I try and know everyone's name. I don't care if yeah. it's like the substitute court deputy clerk that's only there today in the afternoon because Martha has a doctor. I'm gonna know your, your name. Absolutely, hundred percent critical, important. Yeah, and thing thank everybody do. all the time profusely. Yeah. Like. You know, you have to be genuine. You have to be real. Uh, you know. No, you don't. You just need to know. <laughs> Look, I've gotten the. Uh, I, I had a trial where we won, and I, you know, kicked the defense's ass in the case. I was all proud. And then after, you know, we're in the hallway, and I'm asking the jurors. I'm like, "Hey, uh, do you have any? What you know, worked? What didn't? Yeah, well, critique for us or any compliments?" And they go, "Do you 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 really would like us to critique you?" I'm like, sure. She goes, you want me to be honest? And the defense attorney's next to me. I'm like, yeah. And she goes to the defense attorney, you were unprofessional and unprepared. And to me, they go, you were arrogant. And I go, oh, fuck. 
Wow. That really hurt. And you know what? She was right. I was arrogant during that trial. And the verdict could have been so much better. Wow. And that was a long time ago. You were just cocky. You were like, I'm killing these I, I was just being arrogant. I was being arrogant instead of being gracious or just being real, just being a regular person. We teach this thing called status when we're um, teaching our improv and status is behavior and there's high status, there's low status. One is not better than the other. It's just the way people behave based on their life experience. Some people are high status specialists, some are low status specialists. Some are great at infiltrating and changing their status. But, you know, you can perceive yourself one way and your audience sees you a completely different way. And that's when I realized I'm oblivious to how I was, how these people saw me. And it was very eye opening to get that. It was like the best information I could have gotten was that I was being arrogant. And I, I really try not to do that or be too slick. Like when I'm in trial, like I'll even ask Asher during jury selection or during the trial, I'm like, am I being too slick? Yeah, and, and also something I learned from Brian is that no matter how many successes you get or you know how many achievements, Brian, it almost makes you even more humble. Like if we're at a networking event or in trial or wherever it may be at a dinner, He's going to talk to everybody, no matter who they are, and be interested in them. And some people, when they reach a higher level of success, they're like, why would I speak to somebody like that? I'm, they have nothing to offer me. But what, what I learned from Brian is that you need to talk to everybody because everybody has something to offer. Mm. Um, and I learned from that. Yeah. It's really important. I, I mean, you, you, you're always learning. Um, and, and you're always evolving. We are evolving as trial lawyers, as human beings, as storytellers. And, uh, and unless you're willing to, you know, take that information and, and adapt your behavior, you'll, you'll be stuck in a status. And it's good. This it, is very helpful for me to hear. I, 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 I have definitely gotten that note at different junctures of my life. You're being a little too slick or whatever it is. And sometimes, sometimes I know, sometimes it rings true. Sometimes I didn't even realize. Um, so this is very helpful, but totally didn't, would never have even known that that was something that you had to orient around or whatever. I mean, when we met in that Cabo airport, I was like, oh, this guy's like the most jolly relatable. I was like, if, if everyone at this event in Cabo is going to be like this dude, I came to the right place. Seriously. I was like, oh, this guy's so cool. And like, I had no idea that you've won many multi-million dollar verdicts. I, I actually didn't even know you were a lawyer. I was like, oh, he's some side guy that Gary brought to just entertain <laughs> us. I was like, this guy's pretty cool. And then I see you on the line. I was like, oh, ESQ. Okay. He's a lawyer. <laughs> like I didn't know. Um, yeah. so really, and thank you. Thanks for making time to do this. Yeah. Thanks course. for always giving back. And, uh, thanks for letting me be in your office without even knowing. And thank I'll you for having us as well in your home. Totally. I got, I got jelly when I saw that Asher came with his dad. I was like, why didn't you ask me? That was an incredible, <laughs> that was an incredible podcast. I, I asked you before him actually for the record, yeah. but, um, that was an incredible podcast for your dad. But this, this was, this was also just getting, getting your hits out tailored, um, weaving in with advice, really beautiful stuff. So, yeah. so thank you very you much. You know, I, I encourage you to come by and let's experiment in the theater and go up there and do some improv work, bring one of your cases that you want to develop a theme you know, it's interesting when we do the improvised trial, sometimes we have somebody play the judge. Asher's played the judge before. And, he, and we have a gown. And we have a gown. It's and, my graduation and, and like gown. sometimes you did, you uh, uh, were the judge in a case where CJ and I were like fighting during the, it was like we were taking it so seriously. And sometimes you need to try the case with the mean judge. And sometimes you have to retry it in the improv trial with the nice judge. Because you're going to tell the story different with a different referee and with different counsel. I mean, it really, you remember that? I love, when you guys were fighting, um, I was like, settle down. <laughs> and then Brian was doing voir dire and he was making the jury laugh. I was like, Mr. Brighter, stop making the jury laugh. And he was like, Your Honor, I can't help it. And the jury keeps laughing. <laughs> well, there, there so are some judges that will let you get away with it and some judges that will shut you down. I've been 
threatened with contempt on more than one occasion. I bet. And I you bet. need to know, like, all right, that's enough. I, I I, I, and I also, can't. since Brian gave me a shout out on the wall on the Wallace podcast. Brian has been an incredible mentor to me, so thank you for everything. Sure, yeah, and, and I'll take you up on. And yeah, definitely me. come by the office. Yeah, Brian's an amazing mentor, and he just gives freely without asking anything in return. So. Oh, wait a second. I, oh, sorry, I, I, I brought <laughs> cash. I don't know. <laughs> and just bring some of those salt and vinegar chips. Okay, will do. Those will be. Yeah, shout out to Doctor Self Tape You Podcaster Studios with the salt and vinegar chips and yeah. more. Thank you again, really. Thank, thank you. you for thank having you so us. Thank you for having us. Of course, this is great. Thank you.